I have found that sometimes our story is eloquently written by fierce advocates who survived mental institutions and at their own expense self-publish their story. These expatient advocates emerge decades and even centuries before our modern expatient movement. Unlike today where tens of thousands of us have joined together and found power in numbers, these first leaders in the expatient movement often worked alone and tirelessly to right the wrongs they had suffered in institutions. For instance, here is a memoir written by Elizabeth Packard and published in 1879. It is called Modern Persecution or Insane Asylums Unveiled. It tells the story of her involuntary incarceration at the Jacksonville Asylum in Illinois. This is Elizabeth and her husband. He was a Presbyterian minister. In her first person account, Elizabeth Packard tells the story of being committed to an insane asylum because she did not hold the same religious beliefs as her husband. A hundred years before Thomas says, this brilliant and quick-witted woman wrote, quote, had I lived in the 16th century instead of the 19th century, my husband would have used the laws of that day to punish me as a heretic. In other words, instead of calling me by the obsolete title of heretic, he modernizes his phrase by substituting insanity instead of heresy as the crime for which I am now sentenced to endless imprisonment in one of our modern inquisitions." Unquote. Here we see Elizabeth Packard's grief as each of her five children are taken away from her. The theme of women having children taken away after being labeled mentally ill is as relevant today as it was in 1879. This is just the first of many examples you will hear of issues and injustices that are as real today as they were 125 years ago. I love Elizabeth's spirit. Here she is refusing to collaborate in her involuntary commitment. She refused to leave her home to get on the train that would take her to the asylum, thus forcing proper Victorian men to do the unthinkable, manhandle a lady onto a train. From the train, she was taken by stagecoach to the asylum. Note Elizabeth's sense of humor as she depicts 11 coaches whizzing up to the front doors of the very, very busy insane asylum in Jacksonville, Illinois. And here she goes again, Elizabeth on yet another sit-down strike, refusing to walk to her room at the asylum. Using nonviolent resistance, she again forced proper Victorian men to humiliate themselves by manhandling a woman as Superintendent McFarlane looked on. Like so many of us, Elizabeth became outraged at the abuse perpetrated on other inmates. In this picture, she shows a staff person abusing a patient. Elizabeth Packard calls this book chapter, How to Make Incurables. Elizabeth was able to secure her release from the institution. After holding a public trial, she was judged not insane by a jury. She then proceeded to petition legislators in 31 states to change the status of women with regard to commitment laws. This resulted in the passage of the Packard Laws to protect women from wrongful commitment to asylums by relatives hoping to profit from a woman's commitment. Another expatient activist was Ebenezer Haskell, pictured here escaping from the Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane. He also wrote the story of his experience. It was called The Trial of Ebenezer Haskell, which he self-published in 1869. Thanks to the pen and ink sketches in his book, 
We know about practices such as lunatics being put on view for the pleasure of proper citizens of the upper class of Philadelphia. Haskell's book also shows the practice known as the spread eagle cure, where many buckets of cold water were poured into the faces of restrained inmates in an effort to shock them into compliance. Here is the state hospital in Augusta, Maine. Isaac Hunt spent three years involuntarily committed to this asylum, and when he got out, he published his account of what happened. Isaac Hunt's book is called Astounding Disclosures, Three Years in a Madhouse by a Victim, written by himself. It was published in 1852. In it, he writes, Quote, about the ninth day after I went into the asylum, I was again subjected to the horrid wildfire medicine, which was followed by the same terrible and strange sensations and wandering over the ward. I refused to suffer this treatment. I refused to take the medicine. The attendant insisted that I should, and harsh words followed. I told him the medicine was destroying me and I would not take it. He then commanded me in a tone of authority to take the medicine. I did take it. I took it from his hand and dashed it out the window. In a moment, this stalwart, muscular man struck me a violent blow upon my head." Unquote. Dr. Isaac Ray was the superintendent at the asylum in Maine when Isaac Hunt was a patient there. In the same year that Hunt published his scathing first-person account of the asylum, Dr. Ray wrote a paper in which he warns the brethren that, quote, the most prolific source of this distrust of hospitals for the insane is undoubtedly the communications of patients themselves, unquote. He goes on to discredit ex-patient narratives by saying that the insane are liars by nature. Quote, it is equally well known that no moral traits are so common among the insane as a total disregard of veracity." Unquote. In this way, Dr. Ray began the long tradition of mental health professionals dismissing and discrediting first-person accounts written by ex-patients. Despite the unwillingness of most professionals to listen to us, many, many ex-patients have continued to emerge from mental institutions to write of their experience. Some books are better known than others, but virtually all have been deleted from the master narrative as told by mental health professionals. As leaders, it is vital that we appreciate the power of first-person narratives to destabilize the master narrative. As leaders, we must dare to speak our truth. And we must be willing to support each other as the inevitable backlash tries to single us out, attempts to discredit us, and tells us we are liars by nature. We must support each other in our struggle to have our truth be heard. Another place we can find expatient history is in old asylum postcards. Around 1910, postcards had become a preferred way of keeping in touch. Between 1911 and 1920, a billion postcards were mailed every year, making postcards to the early 1900s what email is to the early 21st century. Photographers would include any significant buildings as a theme for postcards, including insane asylums, like this one, the State Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. 
I'm sure you can all remember canoeing during your stay at the state hospital as depicted in this postcard from Westboro State Hospital in Massachusetts. Or perhaps you remember playing golf at Taunton State Hospital. Or strolling down Lover's Lane at the State Hospital in Independence, Iowa. Or simply enjoying the pleasures of the peaceful life, like here at Toledo State Hospital in Ohio. Indeed, Toledo State Hospital takes the prize as the rowing capital of insane asylums. And most remarkable to me is that while all this rowing was going on outside of Toledo State Hospital, inside the hospital I found this wire mesh restraint helmet fashioned for a human being to wear as part of their care. The mesh covered the person's face so that almost no light entered. There's no doubt that asylum postcards told a story about the outside of mental institutions, like this one in Utica, New York. This story fit nicely with the master narrative told by institutional psychiatry. However, a closer examination of these postcards reveals another story. For instance, this is a postcard of Worcester State Hospital in Massachusetts. It was written by a patient named Chet on March 8, 1909. Chet wrote, quote, Dearest, the draws fit all right. I'm anxious to get home. Please write and ask the doctors when I can come home. Now Dr. Houghton and Dr. Quimby are the ones to ask. A big hug for you. Right soon. P.S. Minnie wants me to come home. They are letting them go home in different wards now. Chet. Sadly, Chet's message never made it home to his relatives. Though the postcard has a stamp and mailing address, it has no postmark and was never sent, probably because the hospital screened Chet's mail. Again, we see the policing function of the politics of memory the censorship of whose voice will be heard and whose will be silent.